Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, the Secretary of State talks about what you need to know for the coming midterm election, and a senator explains why Minnesota should exempt recipients of student loan forgiveness from state taxation. Plus, the results of the 2022 State Fair Opinion Poll. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The state fair is over, the kids are back in school, and now it's time to turn our attention to the midterm elections. The November ballot includes choices for Minnesota's constitutional officers, the eight congressional House seats, and all 201 state legislative seats in newly drawn districts. Joining me to talk about the upcoming election is the Secretary of State, Steve Simon. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Let's start with the basics. If I'm not mistaken, early voting is just around the corner. When does early voting begin and where do people go to vote? You are right. It is just around the corner. We just put the summer season behind us, as you said. We're now into fall and school time. September 23rd, Friday, September 23rd is when that begins. And voters who are interested in voting as of that point can do so in really two basic ways. One is in person, typically at a county or city office. And if you don't know where to go, our website can provide that information. It's mnvotes.gov. You can type in your address and it'll tell you where to go to vote absentee. The second way, of course, is to vote from home, to vote from your kitchen table if you want. And there you can go to that same website and order the ballot so that it comes to you at home. You have to furnish some personal identifying information, whether it's a partial uh, driver's license number, partial social security number, and the like, and that uh, ballot will come to you. And remember, two years ago, we saw a huge surge in voting by absentee. A large majority voted that way. And so Minnesotans are now hopefully more familiar than they once were with that whole process. But to vote by mail, you go online to request a ballot, is that right? Yeah, that's the best way I'd say to do it. You could also do it in person by going to a government office. But if you go online, mnvotes.gov, you can order the ballot and we'll come right to you at home. And then you fill it out and you stick it back in the mail to send it back? Correct. You could do that. You could drop it off in person. You could, under some circumstances, have someone deliver it for you. Uh, but there are multiple ways to get it back. But remember, you've got to get it back by Election Day, not postmarked. It's got to get back by Election Day. However you do it, that's the rule. You were last on the program in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic. And one question that I asked you then was whether there would be enough election judges and poll workers to staff precincts. That question remains, although the reason for it is slightly different. There's less concern about personal health and more concern among some workers who are reluctant to staff polling places due to threats of intimidation or fear. Will there be enough poll workers, election judges, to staff our precincts across the state? I am cautiously optimistic that there will be. I check in constantly, as in several times a week, typically, with county and city partners. And what they tell me generally, there are some exceptions, is they feel pretty good. We always tell them to over-recruit. Uh, make sure you have a buffer uh, and some wiggle room in case some people drop out at the last minute. But you're right, there has been a shift in emphasis. And one thing that COVID taught us was how to adapt, all of us. I don't care what area of life it was, home, school, personal, business. And we had to do that in 2020, as you say, for different reasons. But as a result, we got to exercise a different muscle in the election system, which was looking at different places and different targets to get those election judges, not just the, the, the trusty standbys. As great as they are, some of them didn't want to participate in 2020. So I am confident that despite the different reason for a possible shortage this year, that the counties and cities and townships, they're the ones who hire, train and pay, train and pay the election judges that they will come through as they did in 2020. The joke around our office basically is, hey, if we could survive 2020, we can survive anything. So it's daunting, but nothing probably is as daunting as 2020. The, in 2018, the United States Supreme Court ruled against a Minnesota law that prohibited political clothing and buttons from polling places. So can Minnesotans now wear whatever they want to the polls? Not quite whatever they want. That decision um, drew a line, at least we and others interpret the line like this. You can wear whatever political clothing you want to the poll, except clothing or, gar or items that depict or name someone on the ballot that day. That day. So it's okay if you want to walk in with your Tim Pawlenty ball cap or your Mark Dayton t-shirt, that's fine. They're not on the ballot this year. But 
it's not a good idea and probably still uh, the law uh, would still hold up as to anything can, that could be considered electioneering, a slogan or um, a depiction or a name of someone who's on the ballot. So walking in with your uh, Jensen for governor hat or your Walls for governor t-shirt, you can't do, but pretty much anything else you can. All manner of political expression is okay on a button, on a hat, on whatever. Okay. Uh, elections themselves have become mired in accusations of fraud. You have consistently said that Minnesota has a very secure, accurate voting system, both against threats foreign and domestic. And I remember two years ago, we were talking about foreign threats as well. How do you convince the skeptics that our elections are secure this time around? Yeah, well, Minnesota has a great record, stretching back years and decades. We know that we're the envy of the country, literally. Secretaries of state from both parties have come up to me and asked me, how do you guys do X? Or how do you guys do Y? We want to do that. Our elections are fundamentally fair, accurate, honest, and secure. And one measurement of that, there are many, but one measurement of that is our sky-high turnout year after year after year. For the third time in a row in 2020, we were number one in the country in turnout at almost 80%. You don't get to record-smashing levels of turnout unless people in their gut, in their heart, know that the system is fundamentally honest and clean. Now, there are good people of good faith and who have different viewpoints than I do, for example, on what the system ought to be, but I think people recognize it's fundamentally fair. But to those who are skeptics, I would say this, don't just take my word for it. Look at what other outside folks have said about our election system in Minnesota and nationally, whether it's the former attorney general, whether it's the current FBI director, whether it's 60 plus federal and state judges appointed by Republicans, Democrats, including the prior president, who have said when presented with evidence or allegations of wrongdoing or misconduct, it isn't there. 2020 was the most watched, litigated, scrutinized election in American history by far. And in the end, American democracy and Minnesota democracy came through with flying colors. So to follow up on that, uh, pollsters and pundits are expressing concern over the damage that those recent allegations of voter fraud have had on the integrity, the perception of the integrity of our voting system and on democracy as a whole. Is our democratic process under fire? Yes, it is under fire. I think the number one threat to our democracy in Minnesota and the nation is this cloud of organized, coordinated disinformation that has descended on too much of the country and too much of the state. Um, and it's a real problem. Um, there are good people, everyday folks, who have been taken in by some of it, most of it, sometimes all of it, um, and that's unfortunate. We can have a good faith argument back and forth about election policy, what the system ought to be. That's democracy. We should have it. And we should have it frequently, often, and always. What we shouldn't do is permit super spreaders of disinformation for political reasons, economic reasons, sometimes both, to spread propaganda, lies, untruths, disinformation about our election system wilder and wilder and more bizarre conspiracy theories that don't hold up to any scrutiny, have no basis in fact, but sound good and get people to their feet at rallies. It's not true. It's demonstrably false. And too many good people are taken in by some of this. So do I think it's a threat? Yes. Is our democratic system under fire from that threat? Yes. But I am a long-term optimist. I really am about democracy in Minnesota and democracy in the country. And part of it is, what we just went through in 2020. We withstood the ultimate stress test for our democracy, not just COVID, but some of the things that we've been talking about as well. And does democracy feel a little bit dinged and dented over the last few years? Yes, but these institutions were built to last and they have lasted. And I think in the long run, we're gonna be in okay shape. The fever will break, but we gotta make sure it breaks. That's up to all of us. Finally, before we go, some of these elections in November are going to be very close. How long should voters be prepared to wait for a final result? Well, we've had experience, as you know, in Minnesota, and as your viewers know, going back to, but certainly including more than, the 2008 epic Coleman Franken recount. Now, that was exceptional and extraordinary and once in a generation. That lasted several months. That's a really um, extraordinary situation. I don't expect that to be the norm. And there are reasons why, given some changes in election law, any repeat of a Coleman Franken like recount would, would take less time than it did then. All I can say is we have a, a record in Minnesota of reliably conveying election results uh, quickly um, and resolving as quickly as we can any disputes and recounts. So the bottom line is soon, if not instantaneous, um, 
uh, for sort of everyday elections. But in the, in the event of a recount, including a statewide recount, that's going to take some time. But um, you know, all I can say is, and it depends on the variables of every case, as soon as possible. I don't expect another Coleman and Franken multi-month, eight, nine-month sort of um, situation. OK. Secretary of State Steve Simon, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now that the great Minnesota get-together has come to a close, the results are in from the Minnesota Senate's State Fair opinion poll. More than 5,000 fairgoers took a few moments at the Senate booth to weigh in on 12 topics posed in the unscientific survey. Highlights of the poll include that a majority of poll takers, 62 percent, believe that Minnesota's moratorium on new nuclear power plants should be lifted, with 31 percent saying yes without qualifications and 31 percent saying yes but only if a permanent storage solution for nuclear waste becomes available. When asked if Minnesota should make all Social Security income exempt from state taxation, nearly 75% of respondents said yes. 72% of fairgoers who took the poll believe that Minnesota should allocate funding for schools to provide free menstrual products in restrooms for students in fourth through twelfth grades. And when asked if Minnesota should follow its neighbors and legalize sports betting, 58% said yes. Broken down further, 32% said that sports betting should be allowed at racetracks, in tribal-run casinos, and online. 17% prefer legalized betting at racetracks and tribal-run casinos only. 6% said only in tribal-run casinos. 3% said sports betting should be legal online only. 29% of respondents said that Minnesota should not legalize sports betting. Some of the other topics on the opinion poll included whether Minnesota should eliminate 3-2 beer, whether cities and towns should be allowed to implement rent control measures, and whether all operators of private watercraft should be required to take a boating safety education course. President Joe Biden recently announced a plan to forgive $10,000 to $20,000 in student loan debt to qualifying borrowers. At the federal level, there is no tax on loan forgiveness, but Minnesota is among several states that will tax forgiven student loans as income unless lawmakers enact a fix. Senator Kerry Dietzik joins me now to talk more about it. Thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me. So according to the Star Tribune, someone who receives $10,000 in student loan forgiveness would owe the state of Minnesota somewhere between five and $800. So I would guess then that this, the student borrower who gets the 20000 then could owe twice that. Um, this could potentially change tax brackets for these student borrowers. So why should they be, be forgiven this tax liability for this loan forgiveness that the president has announced? Um, so that's a great question, and so first I'll get into some background. So Minnesota is one of the few states that we don't automatically conform to federal law changes, and so that's why we come back. We like to literally review the law changes and decide if we want to conform or not, and we do that with all sorts of tax provisions, and so we don't automatically conform, and then we review it, and sometimes we fully conform, sometimes we partially f conform, and sometimes we don't have a tax bill, so that conformity is delayed and the people have to file an amendment. Um, we also, in general, tax loan forgiveness, unless it is specifically exempted, and so that's why we need to come back and do a bill. Between conformity and then, because we say that that loan forgiveness is income, we need to exempt that. So I personally think we should do this. I represent the University of Minnesota Minneapolis campus in Augsburg. And talking to a lot of students over the last few years, they are graduating with huge amount of debt. Many of them are working, 
They just, between the cost of tuition and the cost of housing, outpaced inflation. So they are paying huge amount of debts. So they are paying something, but I think this helps them, and it helps them um, plan for the future. Right now, that debt is changing the way they are looking at their lives. Once they graduate, can they afford to buy a car? Can they afford to buy a house? Or they're looking at their loan payments are the cost of a housing payment. And then they're, it's delaying their start of having families. And so it is impacting their lives going forward. So I think if we value education and we want educated workers, we want them to go to that school. It helps our students, it helps families, and it helps our Minnesota economy. Now, I would imagine, just to play devil's advocate here, that there are some people who think that because these borrowers are getting this gift of some loan forgiveness, ten or $20,000, that they should just have to pay a little something. Like, that's only fair. How would you respond to those people? I think it is fair, and I would say that they are paying some. We're not wiping out, completely wiping out their debt. This is a portion of their debt. I think it's, um, from President Biden's standpoint, I think it was a nice compromise. We do have other loan programs currently, other student loan programs that are are, um, that loan forgiveness is tax-free. So it is not something for Minnesota. It's not something out of the ordinary. We already provide that loan forgiveness and tax exemption on the public surface loans and on a lot of for um, a lot of healthcare positions, especially if they're working in the rural settings. We forgive portions of their loan, and that loan is then that loan forgiveness is tax exempt. So last week, you and your tax committee colleague, Senator Ann Rest, released a statement that together you will author legislation to remove Minnesota tax liability on this student loan debt forgiveness. Both Democrats and Republicans have voiced some support for this. Is it a pretty easy fix then? I would say it's an easy fix, but passing a tax bill isn't always easy. So, so could this be done as a standalone or does it need to be part of a larger tax bill? We have passed early tax bills, early conformity tax bills in the past. So we could come in a special session and pass it or we could come back and pass an early conformity bill because there were several items in that 2020 tax bill that had broad support but was never brought to the floor that included tax conformity. In your view, is there urgency to getting this done? Because I know that, that there will likely be court challenges to President Biden's action here. Is if there's a special session, would you want it to be done now or can it wait till the regular session? What's the urgency level? I think the urgency is helping Minnesota taxpayers. I think that's the urgency level. Um, we could come in and pass it in a special session with a whole bunch of other conformity issues. Um, if there is a court case that stays the forgiveness, that would also then stay, stay the tax exemption. And so if we pass a bill or not, you know, it would be stayed if there's a court case. So you referred to this a little bit, but I'm going to ask it directly because there's been a fair amount of hand wringing from both sides of the aisle over over this action by President Biden. Some progressives have said this doesn't go far enough because, as you said, there are many students, um, former students who who have a significant amount of debt debt. Some conservatives, though, are calling this an overreach. So what is your view about this? I think it's a nice compromise. I would have preferred it gone through Congress and they had a good debate on it and passed it, but I think this is a good compromise for President Biden. You and Senator Russ concluded your press release last week by saying that the state needs to explore ways to bring down the cost of higher education. Um, and there are critics who are saying that, that this action, it doesn't change the university model for high tuition in the first place. So it's really not getting at the underpinning of high tuition costs. So that question in itself is almost like its own segment, but, but what should be done to address the high cost of higher education? Definitely, I think this is, this is like a Band-Aid. We need to get at that underground look at why is the cost of tuition so expensive and how do we make it more affordable and accessible for everybody across Minnesota. I have worked with Senator Klassen over the last 10 years to do a variety of different bills to reduce the cost of tuition, including um, increasing the tax credits and subtractions that we already offer. Um, and then I think an easy way or a best way would be to increase the uh, Minnesota grant program because that helps students. It's like the federal, it's like our state equivalent for the Pell Grant. It helps students that are from moderate and low income afford college. And so that is one thing that we could do. But I think we really need to look at that broader issue because that helps our Minnesota economy and it helps students and helps family. And I also think we should come back and look at that as part of a special session. Okay. Well, you know, 20 to 30 years ago, the higher education, at least for state institutions, 
they got a lot more dollars from the state than they do now. Would you like to see taxpayer dollars more heavily invested in higher education, or has that ship sailed? I think when I went to college, it was about 70% was paid for by the state, and now um, the state pays for closer to 30%. And so I think somewhere in there we need to have a better balance because families can't afford it. Your average family can't afford it, and most jobs require some post-secondary education. So again, that will help our Minnesota economy. Senator Carrie Dietzik, thank you so much. Thank you. For over two decades, the Minnesota Historical Society has offered the shadows and spirits of the state capitol tour. What will guests encounter on this tour? What we do is we recreate the historic lighting in the building as if you're walking into it for the first time in, early, in the early 1900s. And as you walk through these shadowy environs, you run into historical spirits or characters that would have been part of the stories of Minnesota's capital. On this tour, which spirits will guests encounter? Uh, there's a variety of different people from the building's past. For instance, Judson Bishop is a Civil War veteran who will tell his stories about his war experiences, and that's based upon those beautiful paintings of Civil War regiments uh, in the governor's reception room. We'll see uh, Clara Uland, who is a woman suffragist. Uh, she's talking about the right for women to vote and that, that march to getting that right eventually. And also in the Supreme Court, uh, where we're standing right now, we have the artist appears, and that's John Lafarge. She's the one who did these four murals that tell you the evolution, the changes of law throughout time. Does the tour cover the entire Capitol? It covers a lot of the different spaces that you would see on any regular tour. So we visit the rotunda, that's where the tour begins, go to the governor's reception room, go to the Senate, the House Gallery, get to see the chamber kind of from the bird's eye view, and then we come to the Supreme Court. What kind of feedback have you gotten over the years from people who've experienced this tour? Yeah, it's always very positive because you can come during the day to see our regular tours, and so you get one perspective of the building, but when you recreate the historic lighting, it really gives you a sense of what it would have looked like here 100 years ago. And uh, I think people are just thrilled to see these different stories being told, and it's really just a, a really fun way to look at the Capitol in a different light. The Woman Suffrage Memorial on the Capitol grounds commemorates the efforts of the Minnesota women who tirelessly worked to achieve women's right to vote. Recently retired Cat Board Secretary Paul Mandel joined me to talk about its history and its recent renovation. The Minnesota Woman Suffrage Memorial is now over 25 years old and it's recently undergone a facelift. Let's start with the lattice. What does it represent and what was, what was done to sort of bring it up to date? Sure. Well, we've got, it's meant to be a screen, an obstacle, um, which was what women met when they were trying to get the vote. It also has, on, on the lattice work, it has the 23 names of women suffragettes from Minnesota. Um, and Minnesota ratified the amendment the year before it became a full amendment. So we had a celebration here in uh, 2019, for instance. But the, the, between the wall and the lattice work, you're, you're obstructed from getting into the garden, which just exempt, exemplifies how the women were obstructed from getting the vote. And the wall was redone, re-poured, and the lattice was cleaned up, and, and all the, the uh, explanatory plaques that are along it were also cleaned and repatinated and such. And this garden has changed a lot over the years. I think we talked once about how people wanted it to be roses and then they wanted it to be this and that. And now we have a pollinator friendly garden. Talk about the choice of plantings, what they represent and, and the ease of care perhaps. The garden was completely replanted. We had to take out all the old soil because it was so infested with weeds. So we replaced about three and a half to four feet of soil. The memorial was supposed to have white and focus on white, yellow, and purple, especially white and yellow as the colors of the suffragettes. Um, we started with prairie, and because this whole area is, of course, watered for lawns, the grasses were so invasive and weeds and everything else, it was the wrong condition for prairie, 
And of course, prairie flowers, people are used to the hybrid verms of Shasta daisies and things like that, where you see a lot more showiness. Whereas prairie, you have a small plant at the bottom and a stalky, small flower at the top. And it was never very successful um, because of the heavy watering and fertilizing and the, the bluegrass. It was favorable to bluegrass, not prairie. Soils were too good, et cetera, et cetera. So we abandoned the, the prairie for hybrids. We infilled for things that had not succeeded. And in this last iteration, um, also over time, we consolidated the gardens because there were like twice as many gardens and they just couldn't compete with the grass. So we consolidated them into larger planting beds um, and went to total pollinators in this example. Even the shrubs are nine bark, which is a, a pollinator. And we purposely focused again on the purples, yellows, and whites. And right now you're seeing a lot of the yellows and the whites, a, a lot of the yellows and the purples. One unique aspect of this memorial is the glaciation idea. It's, um, talking about how long it took for women to get the right to vote. Now, it used to be these sort of gravelly pavers and it was misunderstood over time. Now it's been upgraded, maybe more permanent. Talk about the, the evolution of that. We replaced the, these, these um, what people thought were originally sidewalks, which were basically um, on end laid stone that was deteriorating. So we replaced those with poured in place concrete that will last longer. This just reinforced the, the, at both the retreat and the advance of the glaciers as uh, kettles and moraines that we now have in like Taylor's Falls and elsewhere, where the, as the glacier retreated, but it was slow and evolutionary, just like the women's right to vote. One final thing, um, there was one woman who was sort of spearheaded this effort and there's a bench underneath a tree um, to remember her. Can you tell us a little bit about her? Barb Stuhler came to us like early maybe 92 or 93, and she had an idea for a bench, one crab tree, and a few daffodils. <laughs> and we started moving it around the campus, and we were down by the veterans building, and she's like, this is way too much war and stuff, um, and veterans, and she didn't want to invade their space, and it, it, didn't, it sort of got lost on the opera mall. So we picked this spot, but this spot was reserved for three large gardens. We have the Workers Memorial down the bottom. And so the thing just exploded in size. Um, and we had a competition. It was a very, very tight competition. We had six, um, six uh, submittals, and it was decided by one vote to go this route versus a, I think it was a sundial with sunflowers as the theme and such. But she stuck with it through, the, through everything and through the planting nightmares and through the weeding. She even had her women out here at one point weeding um, because the plant, plant crew couldn't keep up with it. Um, and she was just, um, she was unstoppable, but she had staying power and the patience to deal with bureaucracies and the weeds and all the nightmares. Um, so we purposely did a, they did a bench to her and they did the fundraising for that. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.